Hello, Dr. Shashwati. You may continue, please, introducing Dr. Paul Shativa. I will do that at the end of his lecture. I have already given the brief of his lecture, what he's going to talk. Let audience enjoy that. Then we'll see his biodata again. That will be more enjoyable. Thank you. Okay. Professor Vivek, please go ahead. Yes. And I think 30 minutes is given to you. So utilize maybe 25 minutes, then five minutes we will talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bharadwaj, for the invitation. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the climate change and not what is the climate change, but how to tackle the climate change using the concept of nanotechnology. So I'm going to introduce uh, in brief what is nanotechnology. I will also introduce the science behind the climate change. And at the end, I will show you some of the work that we are doing in our lab to really, uh, you know, uh, if we save the earth, then only there could be a one earth and one family. And we all know the climate change is one of the most serious problem that, ma that mankind has ever faced. So I'm going to introduce you with the science behind the climate change and use of nanotechnology to protect the, the combat the climate change. Uh, okay, okay. So before I start my presentation, let me ask this one important question or an interesting question. What was the most important innovation of 20th century? I guess everyone will have a different answer, but one of the answer which you may not think is Haber-Bosch ammonia synthesis, which says you can react hydrogen and the nitrogen. Nitrogen is everywhere, right? We think it's an inert molecule. But Haber, a German scientist, found a way where he can react hydrogen with the nitrogen and get the ammonia. Then he collaborated with uh, Carl Bosch, a BASF scientist working in the industry. And they, they together, within a year, uh, do we have a pointer or something? No. Uh, within a year, they converted this research discovery in the lab into a real process. Both of them got a Nobel Prize. You can utilize a computer pointer. OK, I will use this pointer. OK. Yeah. So, so they got a Nobel Prize for this discovery. And look at this. If there is no haber bosch process, two-third amount of food, we will not have food. Majority of us will not have a food. Just one simple reaction. Imagine the impact of a science, a fundamental discovery onto the human society. right? So even today, even this is like 100 years before this discovery happened, 1909. Now 2022, 20, more than 100 years, but we are still dependent on haber bosch process because it produces ammonia and ammonia gives you all the fertilizers and the increase in the, the food yield, the farming is because of the ammonia, because of the haber bosch process, right? Now, because of that, because now since we have lots of food, look what happened. The population, there is an explosion of population. If you look at the discovery of haber bosch, which is here, and you see huge increase in the population. Right? Because now we have a enough amount of food to eat. Now, if one asks one more question, which is what are the challenges of 21st century? Right? Again, you will come up with water, environment, a lot of that. But I will say it's again haber bosch process. Now, how come it be? If it is an invention in the, the previous century, how come that be that it is, a, it is a challenge? So look, this reaction takes 1% of world's total energy. That's a huge amount, 1%, one reaction. 1% of total energy, and it produces 1% of the CO2, global annual CO2. Right? Carbon dioxide is the key reason for the climate change. And the reason is we always, we need ammonia, our population is increasing, so the ammonia production has to increase, right? So, so what it means is we need to find a way where we can produce ammonia without producing CO2, right? So, which is still not possible right now, everything is at the research level. So to combat the climate change, which is because of the CO2, we must capture and convert the CO2. I will come back to this afterwards. And then we, we need to also see where our country is. We, we always blame the developed country that they emitted the CO2 and we haven't. True, very true. But now in the current scenario, current scenario we are emitting huge amount of CO2. 70% of our energy is still coming from the carbon-based fuel, right? And that will not going to change for another 100 years, whatever you do. Whatever you do in the sense, I use solar light, I use wind, I use solar to electricity. Whatever you do, still you're going to use the carbon-based fuel. You're going to emit huge amount of CO2. So how do I then achieve 
the carbon neutrality, right? How do, how do I make sure that we combat the climate change? And we have this tradition in India, right? We always import everything, right? Although we are claiming that we are using the solar power, but if you really ask this question, majority of the solar power panels comes from the different countries, especially China. Batteries coming from, so we are not dependent. Only we are replacing the oil from the Middle East by the solar panel and batteries from some other countries, right? And in the coming time, this is going to be the technology that we all need. The CO2 that you see in the environment, you capture and convert that CO2 into useful chemicals and which we don't have the technology. So if you really want to be so-called Atmanirbhar Bharat, that means we really need to develop these technology. And I'm going to show you some of these examples how we are doing it in our lab. And that was the vision of uh, Dr. Homi Bhabha, right? He don't want it only do a fundamental research, but really change uh, really make sure that the technology can grow out of the study of science and its application. That science should really benefit the society. And that's what the Department of Energy, Energy and BARC uh, did. And they were able to give India nuclear power. And that's, I think, the real example of Atmanirbhar Bharat. Imagine uh, India without a nuclear power. China will not sit there at the, uh, the border, right? And now it's a time to repeat the same thing. But rather than the nuclear energy, it has to be now the solar energy and the CO2. CO2, we generally think it's the waste, right? It is there everywhere, it's ex excessive waste. But I will show you CO2 is not the waste. We have to treat CO2 as the source of a chemicals, source of the energy, you know, it's a carbon source. Everything that you see around, majority of which is made up of a carbon, right? The chair, everything, the cloth, everything. So can I make those from the CO2, which is free in the environment? That's the question. And if we can do that, that will solve the, not only the CO2 problem, but the bigger climate change problem. Right, so I will quickly explain what climate change is or what global warming is. So global warming is mainly due to the carbon dioxide. Obviously there are some other gases molecule, but CO2 is the real cause. And you can see the increase in the CO2 concentration uh, after industrialization. And you can see this is a more critical, you know, the clear graph where you see now it's 415, now it reached 420 uh, in 2022. That's a huge increase in the CO2 concentration because of the industrialization. Most of the processes are artificial, all of them produce CO2. Cement, petrochemical, pharmaceutical. Think about any production, it emits lots amount of CO2. This, I guess several of you know, look at the, uh, the Arctic Sea ice area. It's around seven million of kilometer in 1980. And now look here, this data is up to 2015. Seven becomes around 3.5. So 50% of ice is melted because of the global warming. Now, what will happen if the ice melts and if the water warms, the water level will also go up. And you can see 1980 and, and this is the y-axis is the year. You can see the increase in the, uh, the water level. And this is a simulation, not a real thing, obviously where there is a recent nature comp which is simulated. And, and if we continue the way we are, right, where we produce the CO2, the way the global warming is increasing, this will be the state of Mumbai. Um, and imagine if it is here, what will happen to other part of the city? And this will be everywhere uh, across the world. It's not only about the environment, but also the diseases. There are lots of diseases hidden in the ice and they are waking up. You can see some of the reports. So see, for example, this report in 2017 by NASA, they found some uh, uh, microbes in these uh, crystals in Mexican mine, which they dated back to 15,000, 50,000 year old. And some of these bacteria are resistance to all the top 18 types of antibiotics. Now imagine we had this uh, virus, right? We are still going through the corona, but there were lots of coronaviruses before from the same family. So we were knowing there some, some scientific information about the coronavirus. But what about this bacteria? This bacteria comes into our life, which is 50,000 year old, have no information, right? So that could be another very serious issue, serious thing that will happen if we don't stop the climate change, if we don't stop the global warming. Now the question is, can we stop the climate change, right? And is it too late? Uh, and I think there is nothing, something called too late. We have to always act and there is a possibility. So the life, the most, uh, most complex form of a matter in the universe is on course for its inevitable extinction. You can say something like that and just, just sit at home, unless we humans, the chosen one, can agree to live within the limits of a nature's rule. I guess all previous talks are also saying the same thing. Follow the nature's rule, right? But who agrees? So it is up to us what happens next, right? So climate 
combating the climate change is more a social responsibility. But what I'm going to talk to you today uh, is what science will do, how the science will help to combat the climate change. Now, what science will do is, how, how does the CO2 in the environment is taken care of? It's all the trees, right? The plants, which takes the CO2, which takes the water. Water has the hydrogen, you have a CO2, and take the sunlight. So use that sun energy, CO2 reacts with the water, the hydrogen, and you get all carbohydrates, all, all the carbon-based products. Now we have many more humans, less number of trees. We have lots of industries producing the CO2. So the trees, and there are lots of studies. Any number of trees you plant now, they are not able to take care of the CO2. Doesn't mean we should not plant the trees. We should plant as many as we can, but the real trees is not going to because we don't have enough land, right? We have more population. So what science can do is they can come up with a artificial trees. Trees which doesn't need a land, right? Trees who doesn't need a water ideally. And they still can capture the CO2, can harvest the sunlight and convert that CO2 into usable chemicals, right? So this is more a fancy thing now. How come that be, right? How come you have a trees which will don't need a land? So what tree mean here is some sort of a material, some sort of a nanomaterial, which has the ability to capture CO2, which has the ability to harvest the sunlight and the water and the same reaction. What trees are doing, these materials will do these reactions. For those who don't know what do you mean by material, say the sand on the beach, this is a material, right? It's a silica, SiO2. And we know sand doesn't do anything. It's, that's why it's lying there. So now the question that we are asking is, what do I do with the sand that stand, sand started working like artificial tree? Sand started active, active, activating or capturing the CO2, harvesting the sunlight and, and convert CO2 into something like that. So that's where the concept of nanotechnology comes in. Sand the particle size is huge, say some micron. But if I break down those sand particles into very small particles, nanometer size particles, I will show you the scale. Then the same sand, which is not doing anything, will start reacting with the CO2, will start converting CO2 into useful chemicals, right? And the dream could be then one day, you will drive your car by filling the CO2 into your car, right? You fill the car by the CO2, you have some sort of a catalytic system, some sort of a material, which will convert CO2 into methane or methanol. Methane is your CNG, right? CNG is 98% methane. And, and this catalytic conversion from CO2 to methane happens using the sunlight, which is free. CO2 is free, water is free. Once you, burn, once you have the methane, you burn the methane, get the energy, drive your car, and, and the methane will again convert back into CO2. CO2 goes back to your reactor, and you, again, you convert into methane. It's a cyclic process. Nothing is lost. Obviously, this is a dream. This is a dream thing. It's a big dream. In the lab scale, it is, it is still possible. At a bigger scale, you still need to uh, work on. Right, so why, why, so what is nano? I guess everyone knows about the nano still. If you look at your hair, it's around 100 microns. So I need to slice them, say, uh, millions of times to get a you know, 100 nanometer size uh, particle. The sand is around 62 microns. So I really need to make a very small nanoparticle to, to make them active. Why they show unusual properties? See, the bulk gold, the jewelry that you all have, have a shady, shiny yellow color. But when you go to the smaller particle size, you can get any color. Ideally, you can make a gold of any color by simply changing the particle because now I will not go into the science part of it, but when you change the size, it has a different electron cloud and it interacts with the light differently. And that's how the colors are. And in recently, we also made a black gold. See here, it's a black, right? So why black gold? What happens when you make a black gold? I will explain that in a, in a, in a, in a few slides. Another thing, the metal gold, metallic, the bulk gold, the rings, and other thing that you are wearing melts at 1064 degrees Celsius. When you go to nano, say at, at some size, one nanometer or some smaller size, you can melt them even at a room temperature. It's still a gold, still a metal. No change in the composition, no change in the you know, chemical structure, but you can see the change in the physical property. So that's how you, you change the, the materials property by simply making the size of the particle so small. There are lots of application of nanomaterials, right? So you have these cloths, uh, which are you know, stain resistant. You coat with some nanoparticle and you put any dust, any, any dirt, it will just repair. People are using this for you know, uh, a car which will never, have, the paint will not chip. It's very uh, uh, stable. Uh, rather than painting our walls, our external wall by normal paint, you can paint with these uh, having the titanium dioxide. 
which has ability to, you know, sunlight has around 5% of UV. It absorbs that UV and degrade all the pollutant around. So your buildings will start cleaning up the air, right? That's possible. Lots of publication in, in health, detecting the health, detecting the diseases in early stages. Uh, viruses, uh, you know, killing the viruses by the nanoparticles. Even I guess some of you may have this QLED, which is a quantum dot based uh, LED TV, high resolution TV. Even in our uh, ancient time, there was this something called Sarvana Bhasma. So the Ansuan Bhasma had nanoparticle, which was discovered obviously very recently uh, in the nature paper. Okay, so that is all about the climate change and how do, how do one use nanotechnology to change, this, change the properties of the material and then sand becomes uh, active. Vivek, getting... sorry for the interruption. Uh, yes. Will you be coming to your work? Pardon? Because we have a shortage of time. Uh, will you be now able to come to your work? That uh, yes, so that's a slide. That's my work. Yeah. yeah. I will take another five minutes. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so now, how do I use these uh, nano sciences to utilize the CO2, utilize the solar energy, and convert CO2 into useful chemicals? Okay. So, one can say CO2 is a very simple molecule, right? Carbon and then two oxygen. So ideally it should be easy to convert. But if you look at the chemistry part, CO2 is extremely stable molecule and you need to put lots of energy to convert CO2 into any useful chemicals. So it's not that easy to convert CO2 into anything. It's one of the stable molecules. So that's where use of nanotechnology comes in. And the, our concept is you store the sun energy into CO2. It's like you're putting the photons, you know, sun energy is made up of photons. You're putting those photons into the CO2 uh, by, by by different ways, right? This is our, one of our material that we made. This is called the nano silica, uh, which allows you to make a uh, different kind of a catalyst, which has the ability to activate the CO2 and harvest the solar light. This is our patented material and now being used for a large number of different applications, including the catalysis and CO2 mitigation. I will skip this. So this is one of our very recent example of converting CO2 into chemicals where we showed that you Take the gold nanoparticles, make them and bring them closer. When you bring the nanoparticles closer, they start talking with each other, some sort of a chemical interaction. And because of that, these material absorb entire visible and near IR light, UV to near IR. Entire thing is getting absorbed as soon as you expose. And that's why they are black, because now they are absorbing all the light. And once they absorb the light, now material has all those photons concentrated in, these material, in this, in this uh, surface of the material. And that photon can be used to carry out the CO2 conversion, CO2 transformation. And it, it also converts, oh, it also converts seawater into drinkable water, right? Because when, once the black wood absorbs the light, it produces the heat and you can use that heat to, to evaporate the seawater and then condense. A simple, you know, non-thermal uh, evaporation of the water. This is something was in the news. This is another example. Can sand on the beach convert CO2 to fuel? This is, this is something uh, abnormal, right? We know that sand is extremely inert. But wh what we showed that sand is nothing but a silica, SiO, SiO, Si, those, I think this is the basic chemistry. So we said, let us remove, remove some of the oxygen from the sil siloxane network. And now the material is ha having this oxygen vacancies, oxygen deficiencies, defects, and it is more reactive night. And CO2, carbon and two oxygen also has oxygen. So as soon as you see a oxygen deficient material, CO2 will go and and fix it there and it activates the CO2 and then it helps in converting CO2 in this case again to methane, CO2 to methane and methane is your CNG gas. This is a very recent example where we showed you can just use a magnesium and now again not even a nanoparticle we showed that even you can just scrap magnesium make just a powder and you add water into the magnesium and bubble the air and you still get a green cement and a fuel because air has a 400 ppm of CO2, right? We, have, we are surrounded by the CO2. So you take that air, bubble it in a water and add a pinch of magnesium, magnesium powder. Magnesium converts into green cement and the, the, the CO2 in the air will convert into fuel. So imagine this, this looks like a magic and we are trying to now you know, uh, commercialize uh, this particular part uh, in, in collaboration with Adani. And it's very, very, uh, the finance, one kg of magnesium is 700 rupees. I'm producing the green cement, which has an expensive value because for the risk level, and you can see. So the fundamental research can 
allow you to uh, you know develop the technology that will help you to combat the climate change uh, the last slide the last two slide plastic i think waste plastic is something there was a talk in the morning i guess we we'll talk about the waste plastic and again it's a more a social responsibility if we don't throw this problem doesn't occur but now since we have a habit of throwing away everything how what do what do i do with this plastic now the simple question could be can i degrade the plastic back to the basic chemicals from where it is prepared right then the cycle is complete that right? and again i can use those chemicals make the plastic or some other chemical uh, other other uh, other other items and that's what we showed that and i skip this to save the time we showed that the plastic can be degraded into basic chemicals and we we develop this new material again a nano material which has acidity so it's a solid acid and you you take a plastic powder add some amount of these uh, solid acid and heat you convert all this chemical waste uh, the plastic waste into the basic chemicals and now you can use those basic chemicals to to prepare different materials we also develop different material which can capture the co2 so right if you don't allow the co2 to go into the environment you capture as soon as they come out then again the co2 problem will be reduced and this is something we are also trying to do okay so nanotechnology has the potential to to you know combat the climate change and our dream for one earth one family with that i like to thank you uh, thanks indian women scientists association for the invitation and organizing this uh, very nice conference and the uh, department of atomic energy who funds tifr in, in majorly and then other funding agencies safi pra shell and mission innovation and with that i like to thank you very much for listening to me thank you vivek it was wonderful uh, can you just give me, give me one clue that what you are going to do with this uh, methane after converting this co2 to methane what is your aim yeah so methane methane is your cng right when you fill the gas cng in your car it nothing but a methane so now i don't need to get a cng from the fossil fuel right i have stopped that inlet to the planet earth and i am going to make a cng okay, from the co2 to, you wanted to collect and convert it to the cng i am not take it you wanted to util, utilize it as a fuel not after collecting it so what is what is the exact mechanism of it i i did not i'm not able to hear you properly the what is the question can anyone repeat question is how you are going to utilize this methane what you are converting how will you utilize Because the methane that methane you itself is another uh, uh, very big, very big uh, threat i got no. okay i got your question i got your question so we never I, going to have this Huh. I, I, unless I, 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 you, you recycle it, unless you utilize it. Yeah. So we are utilizing. So I think what Dr. Rai is trying to say is, methane is at least twenty five. More than CO two. Yeah. So More methane than CO two. Yeah. Yeah. I'm answering. So methane is twenty five times. You know, has has twenty times five, twenty five times, twenty five five, twenty five times more global warming potential than the CO two. Then. what is the logic of converting co2 into methane that's what dr rai is saying which is a very valid point but there is a catch here methane will be a global warming gas if you release the methane into the environment we are not doing that right we are burning the methane it's always the co2 which comes out methane is only in your car methane is only in your reactor and it acting as a fuel right so it's so a cyclic process it has to be extracted from the air so that procedure mechanism